Hi everyone, welcome to Lakeside Church's online worship service. Thank you for coming today. I'm Christian Becker, and I greet you today in Jesus' name. If you live nearby, we invite you to come and worship with us each Sunday at 10.30 a.m., and we'll save you a socially distant seat. Now remember, if you have a prayer request or a message, you can send it to me through our website or through our Facebook page. And please like our Facebook page when you check it out. All right, today our call to worship is from Psalm 13. David says, I trust in your unfailing love, O Lord. My heart rejoices in your salvation. I will sing to the Lord, for he has been good to me. Let's lift our voices in praise to Jesus the Christ, our great God and our Savior, and invite you to sing along as we sing the praise song, Jesus, name above all names. Now this song does repeat, but it, it is about the names of Jesus. And I hope it will help you focus on our wonderful Savior, Jesus Christ. join me in our opening prayer. Almighty God and our Heavenly Father, we're here today to worship you and to lift up the name of our Savior, Jesus Christ. Thank you that he came to be Emmanuel, God with us, to redeem us from our sins so that we could be forgiven. Thank you for your mercy and for your grace toward us. Oh, Jesus, you are worthy of our worship and our praise. Help us to see you as you really are today and to hear from you through your word. We love you, Father. 
We thank you for meeting with us here in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, before we turn to the word, let's sing another great hymn of the church, Fairest Lord Jesus. And I invite you again to sing along if you know it. Now let's turn our attention to the Word of God. All right, before we turn to the Word of God, uh, let's briefly talk again to the God of the Word. Almighty God, we're ready to hear from you today. As we turn to your Word, please speak to us. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be pleasing in your sight. O oh Lord, our Rock and our Redeemer, we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, here we are in an election year, did you notice? Yes. yes, and in an election year, we always hear more about the candidates than we really want to sometimes. And one of the things we hear about is, I don't know if you can see the picture there, but there's all kinds of homes that candidates own. He's got three homes, he's got five. You know, we hear about that. Um, you know, for years, I never thought we'd be able to own our own home. Uh, but now we do, and I've discovered that one home is enough to take care of. I can't imagine what people do if they have multiple homes. When we go on vacation, we usually just rent a place, uh, let somebody else take care of it, right? Some of you may do that too. Uh, but I'm here to tell you that you should not have one home, not two homes. I'm here to tell you that you should have three homes, okay? Now, before you think I've lost my mind, I want to explain, because when you figure this out and understand it, you're going to agree with me that there's no place like home, home, home. All right, now the basis for my talk today is found in God's Word. So if you have a copy of God's Word, I invite you to turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 5. 2 Corinthians 5, we're going to look at verse 1 to begin. 2 Corinthians 5, 1. The Bible says, Now we know that if the earthly tent that we live in is destroyed, what's he talking about? Our body. If the earthly tent we live in is destroyed, we have a building from God. An eternal house in heaven, not built by human hands. So the first home that you and I need to have is a celestial home. A celestial home. The Bible says we have a building from God, an eternal house in heaven. Now along with this picture here, there's like a little sign that says, Gone to Father's house to prepare your home. 
will be back soon to pick you up. I love you, Jesus. I like that. <laughs> he said, I'm going away to prepare a place for you in John chapter 14. Do you have a celestial home? It has to do with your salvation and your eternal destiny. How do you get one? Well, what do you think? How do you get a celestial home? This is not a trick question. Except Jesus is your Savior. Is your savior. That's right. Um, you can't buy it. According to John 14, Jesus is preparing it. The King James says, In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I'm going to prepare a place for you. And he adds in verse 3, And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, there you may be also. And by the way, if you ever run into anybody that says, Jesus never said he would come back. There it is in John 14, verse 3. He said, I will come again. And then you remember the angel said it when he went up to heaven. So to receive it, you must be a child of God. You can't buy it. Well, how do you become a child of God? Let's just review here. John chapter 1, verse 12. The Bible says, To all who received him, to those who believe in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. Children born not of natural descent, nor of a husband's decision or a husband's will, but born of God. You and I must understand and personally respond to the good news about Jesus Christ. We call that the gospel. Well, what is the gospel? Let's just remind ourselves. In 1 Corinthians 15, the Apostle Paul tells us, and I know the words there are kind of small, uh, but Paul said this. He said, Moreover, brethren, I declared to you the gospel which I preached to you, which you also received and which you stand, but which you are saved if you hold fast that word which I preached to you, unless you believed in vain. For I delivered to you, first of all, that which I also received. And here's the gospel, that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, that he was buried, that he rose again the third day according to the Scriptures, and that he was seen, which proved what? That he was alive. I don't know if you remember last fall, I preached on the forgotten fourth fact of the gospel, that he was seen of men, proving that it wasn't just an apparition or their imagination. He was really alive. So let me ask you, are you a child of God? After a person hears the good news about Christ, they have a decision to make. It's not one of those things you hear and you go, okay, so what? You either decide that you're going to turn away from your sinful selfishness and ask yourself, am I willing to give up trying to earn God's favor and accept God's free gift of salvation? It's a gift that God offers to everyone through faith in Christ. doesn't matter where you live. doesn't matter your religion. Everyone can accept Christ as their Savior. So if you repent and turn from your sin and say, Father, please accept and adopt me, not because of what I've done, but because of what Jesus Christ did for me on the cross, you can become a child of God that very day. That's the best news in the world. You don't have to have enough, a certain amount of money. You don't have to be a certain status. Everyone. The gospel is for everyone. So the first home that you need is a celestial home. You get it simply by, by becoming a child of God. Second of all, I would like to propose that you need a Christian home. A Christian home. The second home has to do with your home and family here on earth. Having the first home ought to establish you, uh, lead you to establish a second home, a Christian home. Why? Because a Christian home can be one of the happiest places on earth. Far better than Disney World, <laughs> which is only temporary while you're there. Everybody wants a happy home. I remember seeing a video of a little girl on, on, on uh, YouTube once, just a little tiny girl, and she was like, can't we all get along? Can't everybody just smile? All the time? This is what we want. Everybody wants that, a happy home. Love and companionship in the family circle is worth far more than gold or silver or worldly fame. You know, when it's cold outside, there's only one place most of us want to be? Home, right? Uh, I remember when our kids were students, they'd be out of school, and if you can see a girl looking out the door at the snow, they want to go out there and play in the snow, don't they? That's what they want to do when they have a snow day. But after just a few minutes out there, they want to go back in the house. Why? Because it gets cold outside. That's right. And when you're cold or tired or sick or discouraged, there's no place like home. You remember Dorothy and the Wizard of Oz? That's one line in that movie that resonates, I think, with everyone, doesn't it? There's no place like home. 
It's not the carpet or the furniture or the decoration. It's the love that counts. Why do we want to go back to Grandma's house at Thanksgiving, right? Or Christmas. Because that's home. It's a place where we're loved and accepted for who we are, isn't it? And that's what we long for. Well, what makes a happy Christian home? You tell me. What makes a happy Christian home? Do you ever think about that? Reading the Bible. Good. Okay, what else? Prayer. Okay, good. Good. Parents who love the Lord with all their hearts, right? Not perfect people. Anybody here perfect? Nope. Not perfect people, okay? How about a father that leads away? A mother with a sweet spirit. I thank God for my parents, that God gave me godly parents. You don't get to pick your parents, do you? They say if you want to succeed in life, pick your parents well, right? Try that. How about a focus on knowing and obeying God's word from your heart? When the Apostle Paul reminded Timothy of his home, he called to mind a parent and a grandparent, a mother and a grandmother who raised him in the nurture and the admonition of the Lord. And if you have that, you are truly blessed. If you don't have it, maybe you can bring it in a little bit, whatever your position is in the home. How about a loving discipline from a father? A rebellious child rips happiness out of a home, replaces it with tears and broken hearts. The Bible says, discipline your son, for in that there is hope. And anyone that's had children know that that's a challenge, isn't it? (laughs) Anybody can dispense discipline in the home, but dad is God's favorite for the job, if possible. He's the one that God holds ultimately responsible for discipline in the home, for obeying him. If If we'll lead, our kids will say there is no place like home. No place like home. You know, uh, some people say, well, where do you get that? Well, Eve may have sinned first in the Garden of Eden, but who did God come looking for? Who did God hold ultimately responsible? Adam, right? So if dads will take the lead, it can make a huge difference. Well, first of all, you need a celestial home. Second of all, you need a Christian home. And then you and I need a church home. A church home. This last home is the local body of Christ that you become a member of. And having the first two homes ought to lead you to make sure you have this third home. In the first century, Christians identified with the local church. The Apostle Paul wrote a little letter in the New Testament called Philemon. And in the beginning of the letter, you can't see the words there because we're using the computer this morning and not the screen. Uh, Let me read you what he said. He says, Paul, a prisoner of Christ Jesus, and Timothy, our brother, to Philemon, our dear friend and fellow worker, to Aphi, our sister, to Archippus, our fellow soldier, and to the church that meets in your home. They were identified with a local church. Now, what makes a healthy church? There's a street sign there that says, what is a healthy church? (laughs) What is a healthy church? Someone has said that a healthy church has plain preaching, a praying people, and personal participation. I like that. A has plain preaching, a praying people, and personal participation. The Bible says to preach the word. We do our best to do that here at Lakeside Church of the Brethren. And then I believe it was E.M. Bounds that wrote, No prayer, no power, little prayer, little power, much prayer, much power. And then Participation. Personal participation. The Bible says that they all were in one accord in the early church. We are all ambassadors for Christ, according to the Bible. You are either a missionary or you are a mission field. One or the other, right? Either you are following Jesus and it's your job to take the gospel to someone else, or if you're not following Jesus, you're a mission field. Somebody needs to bring the gospel to you. In the Bible, words like go, daily, from house to house, And they didn't stop teaching and preaching Jesus Christ. Refer to people, not to churches. Okay, They refer to individual people that did all those things. The Bible has some instruction for us about a healthy church. In Romans chapter 12, and if you have your Bible open, I invite you to turn there. This is a practical section of the book of Romans. A lot of doctrine here too, but this is a practical section. And in Romans 12, 1 and 2, some of you have heard this before. Let me just read it from the screen. Therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as living sacrifices, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. 
And then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is. His good, pleasing, and perfect will. Christianity, church membership begins with a life transformation. Allowing God to change us from inside out. Why do I have a picture there of a a butterfly? And, And what do they call this stage right here when it's hanging from a tree? The chrysalis, that's right. Where that caterpillar changes literally from the inside out. It's one of the miracles of nature, isn't it? Into something totally new. And I believe that's a good picture of the Christian life. God changes us from the inside out. He changes our want to, doesn't he? It's no longer a duty to obey God. It becomes beauty. And we enjoy it. And then everyone needs to follow Christ according to their own conscience. In verse 3, Paul says, Because of the privilege and authority of God has given me, I give each of you this warning. Don't think you're better than you really are. The King James says, Don't think of yourself more highly than you ought to think. Right? Don't think you are better than you really are. Be honest in your evaluation of yourselves. Measuring yourselves by the faith God has given us. He says, well, I need to think. We all need to think and think in the right way about yourself. About what your response will look like to the gospel. It's something you decide. The church doesn't decide that. You decide your response. This isn't a cookie cutter Christianity where where we push everybody into a mold and we all have to walk out the door looking like everybody else. You know, we're all going to respond to the gospel according to the faith that God gives us. In order to avoid extremes, the King James says to think soberly. And there are two extremes. There's a, he refers to, I call it the swelled head syndrome, thinking more highly of yourself. Look at me, I'm Joe Perfect Christian, you know. <laughs> if there, your name is Joe, forgive me. All right, swelled head syndrome. Or the opposite of that is what I call the little toe complex. Poor little me. I can't do anything, you know. I'm just a nobody. If you have the Holy Spirit of God, you're not a nobody. God can use you, whoever you are. Obedience to Christ results in being part of the local church. In verses 4 and 5, Paul says, For just as each of us has one body with many members, and these members do not all have the same function, so in Christ we, though many, form one body, and each member belongs to all the others. These verses speak of being part of a local church, a member. Uh, I like that idea. Okay, We're all part of each other, aren't we? We need each other. Don't confuse this idea with the idea of a club membership. Club membership, the basis of that is you attend meetings, you pay your dues, right? And you keep the rules. A lot of times people think of church membership like that. But church membership is completely different. Not A lot of people think it's the same. They say, well, so-and-so a good member of your church? And we think, yes, yeah, they attend regularly, they pay their tithes, <laughs> they pitch in once in a while. That makes a good church member. Well, the New Testament concept is body membership. I don't know if you can see that. It's, it's a picture of Jesus, but it's all people's faces making up his body. I like that. Many members, one body. Then Paul suggests some areas of service in verses 6 to 8 in Romans 12. He says, we have different gifts according to the grace given us. If a man's gift is prophesying, let him use it in proportion to his faith. If it is serving, let him serve. If it is teaching, let him teach. If it is encouraging, let him encourage. If it is contributing to the needs of others, let him give generously. If it is leadership, let him govern diligently. If it is showing mercy, let him do it cheerfully. A man once told me, he said, Pastor, he said, uh, I can worship God sitting on the tree stump in my yard. I don't need to go to church. You might have heard people say that. A man named Nate Larkin said this. He said, Jesus offers a personal relationship to each of his disciples, but he never, ever offers a private one. There's a difference between a personal relationship and a private one. All right. Folks, we don't belong to a federation of autonomous individuals. We belong to the body of Christ. The church is a living, breathing organism whose members are so interdependent that they can only move together. What about you? What kind of church member are you? Are you a club member? Are you a member of the body of Christ? According to the New Testament, membership is something you do, not something you have. Jesus had one goal. 
he said, I'm going to build my what? My church, and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. And he gave us one method to do it, by making disciples. That's the method. There's no plan B. There's only a plan A. We had to come up with a plan B this morning when the projector didn't work. But Jesus just left us with one plan. Make disciples. I believe that many people today are looking for a warm and friendly church that preaches the Bible. A place where they can be encouraged in life and ministry. And a place where they can feel like they've met with God. And that's our goal here when we plan a worship service. We want you to come. We want you to see God as He is. We want you to hear from Him. We want to, when you walk out the door, feel like you met with Him and heard from Him. Some folks attend church for a while but don't join. I invite you to get on board and get involved. And let's find out what God is doing and then work together with Him. It's time for some folks to get off the fence. Some people have been sitting on the fence for years. And make a commitment to serve the Lord with whole hearts. What about you? What about you? Are you a member of the local body of Christ? Now, I know that some of you are. I don't know everybody that's a member and everybody that isn't. But I know some of you are. And we praise the Lord for all that you do here. Thank you for your faithfulness in your ministry at Lakeside Church. Others have a heavenly home and a Christian home, but not a church home yet. Or maybe you've kept your membership at a church that you grew up in, but no longer attend. Why not make this your church home? Why not? Someone has said that membership is a commitment, kind of like marriage. Think about a couple in love. Anyone can say that they're serious about love by moving in together. But experience shows that that doesn't usually work out in the end very well. God asks for a more solid commitment than that. He asks for a commitment of marriage. And when I do marriage counseling, I tell couples, commitment is the super glue of marriage. That's what keeps it together. And once you've found a church home, I suggest you treat your relationship like a marriage, knowing that it's not going to be perfect because it's filled with imperfect people. That's why we're here. It's like a hospital, right? <laughs> where, where people come in need of help. We're all here because we need help from God's Word. It's better or worse, ups and downs, until God takes us all home, right? There's two main mindsets that people have when looking for a church. There's a consumer mindset, and I don't know if you can see that picture, but it's a lady holding a credit card. The consumer mentality, this person looks mostly at things like programs, the church's location. Uh, their main question is, is, what can you do for me and my family? That's a consumer mentality people have when they're looking for a church sometimes. And all of us have that mentality to some extent when searching for God's will. It's only natural. But then there's also what we could call the contributor mentality. And there's some people there working together, building a home. This person looks for a place where they're needed. Their main question is, is where is a local church where I can serve God together with other people? They believe that God's perfect will includes more than just what's in it for me. In fact, they firmly believe that they'll receive the most when they are giving of their time and their talents and their treasures, believing that you can't outgive God. Have you discovered that yet? You cannot outgive God. The Bible seems to agree with this second mindset. Jesus said, give and it will be given to you. A good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over will be poured into your lap. For with the measure you use, it will be measured to you. He said, just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and give his life as a ransom for many. And the Apostle Paul, he said, you know, it's my ambition to preach the gospel, not where it's already been heard, but I want to preach it where Christ is not known so that I would not be building on someone else's foundation. So let me ask you, do you know that you have a heavenly home? I hope you do. Oh, I hope everybody here knows that today. If you don't, please see me. I want to encourage you. You can know today that you have a heavenly home. And then do you have a Christian home? If not, you can be the founder and president of one. <laughs> Take the initiative. And then make sure you have a church home. And we have all three then you'll say there's no place like home, home, home. <laughs> if you're a child of God, you can stay on the right track today just by asking a couple questions. Am I saved and following Jesus? 
That's easily answered. Then, am I an example to my family of a Christian? And then last, am I useful? Those are questions we have to keep asking ourselves. You can be blessed by going to a church where others have sacrificed and built something good, but you can be double blessed by going to a church where your input is needed and your help to serve. And we can work side by side with what God is doing in our community. If you're on the fence, I challenge you today to get off the fence and get in the game with Jesus. All right, let's pray. Heavenly Father, please show us how to be the church in these last days. Please encourage each one here today and those even watching online to take the next step in being a part of the only thing that you said you would do on planet Earth to build the church. Jesus, you said you're going to build your church and not let the gates of hell prevail against it. Please build Lakeside Church and bring on board each one that you have called to be part of reaching this community for eternity so that there will be peace in the hearts of all and justice for those who are oppressed. We ask this in Jesus' name and for his sake. Amen. Well, amen. Amen. All right, our closing song is going to be a prayer. It's take my life and let it be consecrated Lord to thee. I encourage you to make this your prayer to Jesus as you sing.
Now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine, according to his power that is at work within us, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever. Amen. God bless you, and Lord willing, I'll see you back here next week. And remember, listen to the Bible. It's great for your soul.